Hunt and I'm speaking to you today from the Old Operating Theatre Museum and Herb Garrett. Today we are going to be talking uh, about students and surgery at the Old St Thomas's Hospital. So there was a hospital on the site for a very long time. Uh, it closed briefly during the Reformation but reopened and today we're talking particularly about the rebuild that happened in 1702. So you can see that in that image there and it consists of three major courtyards. There's the men's courtyard, which was furthest away. Then there was the administration block, which contained things like the treasury, but also things like the laundries and the kitchens of the hospital. And then the women's block, which is at the front. On the right hand side of that image, you can see a clock tower. And it is that clock tower that we're really going to be looking at and thinking about for this. Initially, the attic of that space was used for storage. However, very quickly, it became used by the apothecaries to dry herbs and to prepare and store medicines. So what was the understanding of medicine like at the time? There was no understanding about uh, microbes and germs. And instead, there had historically been this idea of the four humours, which had to be kept in balance. Um, and often medicine therefore relied on purging or making someone bleed. This involved the use of leeches often, um, many times having 12 or more applied to wherever the illness was. And also this idea of miasma or bad air. And this is an idea that continued from ancient Greece right up until Florence Nightingale. And you can kind of see the wisdom of it. It's this idea that bad air, bad air and bad smells are what is making someone sick. At the time, London was a very unhygienic city, would have smelt very, very bad, and a lot of people were getting sick. So you can kind of tell where the idea came from, even though it was incorrect. So this site is built, we have this church and we have this attic here. And it's as part of kind of a formalisation of medical treatment and education. Um, in 1755, we get an operating theatre for the men's wards. Educational buildings are developed in like 1813, 1814. And in 1822, an operating theatre for women's in the women's wards opens. The teaching space, which is opened in 1814, is kind of an annex to the main buildings. And it's there to encourage students who at the time would have all been male to learn more about how the human body worked. So not only are they watching operations, not only are they going on ward rounds with um, qualified doctors, but they are also studying anatomy. They have a pathology museum so that they can look at um, examples of different illnesses and conditions. There is a library and there is a laboratory. So it's all to do with kind of teaching students, getting them to learn more about how the human body works in order to try and treat it. So this is a description of what a surgical theatre was like at the time. Um, I'm going to be talking quite quickly, so if you want to pause and read, go ahead and do that. But what I really want to draw attention to here is this description of the pupils being packed like herrings in a barrel, being very loud, kind of yelling at the people in front, and it would be very warm, a very difficult space to actually be in. And um, to the right hand side of this slide, you can see a picture of the operating theatre at the museum as it is now. So you've got the semicircular seats, well, semicircular standings, because at the time the students would have been stood, where they would be stood to watch the operations. So which kind of operations could be happening at the time? What could happen was quite limited, and that was because of the risk of infection. So there were kind of three or four main operations at the time. There was trepanation, which involved um, treatment for head injuries and was involved drilling into the skull. There was lithotomy, which was the removal of stones, generally the removal of bladder stones, which was a widespread health condition at the time. There was the removal of external tumours and there was also amputation. And here we can see a surgical kit. So to start with, you'd apply a tourniquet to try and prevent any bleeding. 
You would then use the knife to cut through the skin and the meat. You would use a saw to cut through the bone. You would neaten everything up, tie off the major blood vessels and then wrap bandages around it. These bandages would normally be recycled um, bed sheets from the hospital or other kind of spare fabric where you could use it. So what was this surgery actually like? We've got a couple of descriptions here. Again, feel free to pause and have a closer look. The top one is a description of Robert Liston, who was a very famous surgeon at the time, who was known for being a very quick operator. And it shows this kind of showmanship that he had as he'd stride in, calling out, time me, gentlemen, time me, to his students who all had their pocket watches out. The... Um, Second description, though, is from John Flint South, who was a successful surgeon, and it was talking about kind of the anguish and the difficulty he felt whilst operating, where you would, because the patient was conscious and being held down by some of the students, be hearing their cries. And also this idea of how warm it was in the theatre. So between the noises of pain and the fact that it was very crammed in there, um, you could actually have some of the medical students themselves passing out. There were also very big risks of infection at this time. They don't have an understanding of hygiene, which means they'll often not have washed their hands before an operation. If you remember earlier, I spoke about the um, amazing educational facilities they had, but you might have your student dissecting corpses in the morning and then coming to help with an operation in the afternoon and not having washed their hands between the two things. It likely um, instruments would have been being reused. Surgeons would have been wearing quite bloody aprons because the apron was seen as there to be protecting their clothes. They'd just be op operating wearing like their normal clothes with an apron to protect it. And then also things like those reused bandages I mentioned. So, so infection post-surgery was a real risk. Having said that, generally about two thirds of patients survived and they would have only been doing these operations at times when it was felt to be very necessary. Um, later on, there's two major discoveries that really change what surgery looks like. The first of these is anesthesia, which starts being used in 1846. Ether and chloroform, which mean that you can knock your patient out for an operation. You can operate more slowly and this really transformed medicine. But at the same time, the death rate actually went up. And that's because these operations are happening more slowly. Um, there is more chance for infection to get in. And that kind of continues until the 1860s. where We've got the introduction of carbolic spray. And this means now that you start having a much cleaner environment for your surgery and far fewer patients are affected and dying of infection post-operatively. So this is an image of the operating space as it is reconstructed in our museum, which is within the original site that it would have been. And that Latin there is the motto which translates to for mercy, not for gain. And that's the thing, the students here and the surgeons that were operating were doing so in order to try and save lives. Even though they weren't getting everything right, even though the idea of wearing a bloody apron and not washing your hands seems very horrifying to us, they were doing it because they really wanted to help the patients um, survive, go on and hopefully have very long and fulfilling lives. St Thomas's Hospital is obviously still a hospital today and it is still a teaching hospital today as well. So you have that kind of ongoing, thriving hospital community and students still learning how to do medicine by observing and learning similarly to how they would have done in the past. We are now a museum which is open to the public Thursday to Sunday and looks at medical history over time. And here is a link to some of our social media. Thank you for listening and I hope that this was of interest. Thank you.